When Galileo turned the first astronomical telescope to the sky, the tide began to turn. He discovered that Jupiter had a little retinue of moons circling it, the inner ones orbiting faster than the outer ones, just as Copernicus had deduced for the motion of the planets around the sun. He found that Mercury and Venus went through phases like the moon, showing they orbited the sun. Moreover, the cratered moon and the spotted sun challenged the perfection of the heavens. This may in part constitute the sort of trouble Tertullian was worried about 1,300 years earlier when he pleaded, quote, If you have any sense or modesty, have done with prying into the regions of the sky, into the destiny and secrets of the universe, close quote. In contrast, Galileo taught that we can interrogate nature by observation and experiments. Then, quote, facts which at first sight seem improbable will even on scant explanation drop the cloak which had hidden them and stand forth in naked and simple beauty. Close quote. Are not these facts available even for skeptics to confirm a surer insight into God's universe than all the speculation of the theologians? But what if these facts contradict the beliefs of those who hold their religion incapable of making mistakes? The princes of the church threatened the aged astronomer with torture if he persisted in teaching the abominable doctrine that the earth moved. He was sentenced to a kind of house arrest for the remainder of his life. A generation or two later, by the time Isaac Newton demonstrated that simple and elegant physics could quantitatively explain and predict all the observed lunar and planetary motions, provided you assume the sun at the center of the solar system, the geocentrist conceit eroded further. In 1725, in an attempt to discover stellar parallax, the painstaking English amateur astronomer James Bradley stumbled on the aberration of light. The term aberration, I suppose, conveys something of the unexpectedness of the discovery. When observed over the course of a year, stars were found to trace little ellipses against the sky. But all the stars were found to do so. This could not be stellar parallax, where we would expect a big parallax for nearby stars and an indetectable one for faraway stars. Instead, aberration is similar to how raindrops falling directly down on a speeding auto seem to the passengers to be falling at a slant. The faster the car goes, the steeper the slant. If the Earth was stationary at the center of the universe and not speeding in its orbit around the sun, Bradley would not have found the aberration of light. It was a compelling demonstration that the Earth revolved about the sun. It convinced most astronomers and some others, but not, Bradley thought, the anti-Copernicans. But not until 1837 did direct observations of the stars prove in the clearest way that the Earth is indeed circling the sun. The long-debated annual parallax was at last discovered, not by better arguments, but by better instruments. Because explaining what it means is much more straightforward than explaining the aberration of light, its discovery was very important. It pounded the final nail into the coffin of geocentrism. You need only look at your finger with your left eye and then with your right and see it seem to move. Everybody can understand parallax. By the 19th century, all scientific geocentrists had been converted or rendered extinct. Once most scientists had been convinced, informed public opinion had swiftly changed, in some countries in a mere three or four generations. Of course, in the time of Galileo and Newton, and even much later, there were still some who objected, who tried to prevent the new sun-centered universe from becoming accepted or even known. And there were many who at least harbored secret reservations. By the late 20th century, just in case there were any holdouts, we've been able to settle the matter directly. We've been able to test whether we live in an Earth-centered system with planets affixed to transparent crystal spheres, or in a Sun-centered system with planets controlled at a distance by the gravity of the Sun. We have, for example, probed the planets with radar. When we bounce a signal off a moon of Saturn, we receive no radio echo from a nearer crystal sphere attached to Jupiter. 
Our spacecraft arrive at their appointed destinations with astonishing precision, exactly as predicted by Newtonian gravitation. When our ships fly to Mars, say, their instruments do not hear a tinkling sound or detect shards of broken crystal as they crash through the spheres. That, according to the authoritative opinions that prevailed for millennia, propel Venus or the Sun in their dutiful motions about the central Earth. When Voyager 2 scanned the solar system from beyond the outermost planet, it saw, just as Copernicus and Galileo had said we would, the Sun in the middle and the planets in concentric orbits about it. Far from being the center of the universe, the Earth is just one of the orbiting dots. No longer confined to a single world, we are now able to reach out to others and determine decisively what kind of planetary system we inhabit. Every other proposal, and their number is legion, to displace us from cosmic center stage has also been resisted, in part for similar reasons. We seem to crave privilege, merited not by our works, but by our birth. By the mere fact that, say, we're humans and born on Earth. We might call it the anthropocentric, the human-centered conceit. This conceit is brought close to culmination in the notion that we are created in God's image. The creator and ruler of the entire universe looks just like me. My, what a coincidence. How convenient and satisfying. The 6th century BC Greek philosopher Xenophanes understood the arrogance of this perspective. Here's what he said. The Ethiopians make their gods black and snub-nosed. The Thracians say theirs have blue eyes and red hair. Yes, and if oxen and horses or lions had hands and could paint with their hands and produce works of art as men do, horses would paint the forms of the gods like horses and oxen like oxen. Such attitudes were once described as provincial. The naive expectation that the political hierarchies and social conventions of an obscure province extend to a vast empire composed of many different traditions and cultures. That the familiar boondocks, our boondocks, are the center of the world. The country bumpkins know almost nothing about what else is possible. They fail to grasp the insignificance of their province or the diversity of the empire. With ease, they apply their own standards and customs to the rest of the planet. But plop down in Vienna, say, or Hamburg, or New York, ruefully they recognize how limited their perspective has been. They become deprovincialized. Modern science has been a voyage into the unknown with a lesson in humility waiting at every stop. Many passengers would rather have stayed home.